Gracious God, we seek your spirit now. Move within us. Move through us. Speak your words to our hearts. We might hear your message this day. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. There was once a young man from a small family, but a pious one. Both his father and his grandfather were known for the devotion to God. Indeed, these patriarchs were so close to the divine that some said they talked directly to God, and God talked directly back to them. His mother and grandmother were not quite as well known for their piosity, but they also had stories of trusting in God when the odd seems long. Moments where they prayed to God and God maybe eventually answered their prayers. Moments where it seemed as if God heard them directly and knew them directly and intimately. There was his brother. While not the brightest bulb in the lot, his brother was his dad's favorite and was everything this young man was not. Good with his hands, a great hunter, and the oldest, and therefore the one who should get all of the blessings in this culture of inheritance. The other man himself, well, he had a bit of a rep. He was known for being a troublemaker, and perhaps not undeservedly so. He was a bit of a trickster, a person who knew how to bend the rules in ways that fit him. He was a little mischievous, okay, a lot mischievous. And because of all of this, his own mischievous nature, the favoritive toward his brother and his family's pious nature, he felt a little out of place. He felt like a weed growing in the flowers of, of his family's field. But this young man, whose name was Jacob, would be the one that God would call to carry out the promise of Abraham, would be the one through whom God would call forth fruits that would pass on to the next generation as the people of Israel began to form. And it all began with a moment where God said to him, You are not a weed. Or at least, that's how I would describe that moment in Genesis in light of the Gospel story, where Jesus talks about weeds and good fruit, weeds and wheat, really, and says to the angels, to the people, not your job to figure it out. And the two stories, I think, this parable of Jesus and the story of Jacob, have some interesting fruit to bear and place together. Let me do that this morning for our sermon. First, I believe that both these stories in different ways remind us that it's not our job to discern who does or does not have worth. And by the way, that very much includes ourselves. As I alluded to in my introduction, Jacob was in a bit of a low spot in his life. Even if he had not yet begun the self-examination that I think he hadn't done yet and would come eventually, he had lost everything. Yes, by this point in his story, he had already tricked his brother out of his birthright, selling his birthright for a bowl of soup. And also at this point in the story, he had already tricked his father to receive the blessing that by tradition and by all the rules of his day and age, he had gone again to his oldest twin. And now he feared for his life. And so he fled his home, fled his mother, fled his father, and was going towards his family he had never met, to his mom's family. Yes, to maybe seek a wife, but mostly because he was afraid if he stayed at home in his father's tents, his brother would murder him. It's at this low point, when Jacob has no idea what happens next, no idea what's going to go on, and feels very much like that weed about to be pruned. 
God comes to him and makes promises. Promises that God will be with him. Promises that God has a purpose for him. Promise that Jacob is the one through whom the inheritance, the promises made to Abraham, will go. It is, I think, an uplifting moment is a reason that Jacob names the place Bethel, or the house of God. There's a reason that this is the place Jacob eventually comes back to and makes his tents, makes his home, sets his family. But it's also a reminder to us that God works in ways we don't always see. Because nothing we've seen so far in the story of Genesis suggests that Jacob ought to be the one to receive this. There's nothing to say he was a pious man, nothing to say he knew God, nothing to say he was even a nice man. As said in my introduction, he was a trickster, he was mischievous, he cheated people, and willfully cheated people. So yeah, his brother Esau was not the brightest bulb, but, you know, hey, brother, I'm hungry. You have a whole bowl of soup there. Can I have some? Only for your whole birthright and all the inheritance rights, dude. I mean, that's the opposite of kindness. It works. He said was not very smart. But it's not very nice. It's not very loving. All the things I talk about that God's people are called to, Jacob was not that. Any of it. Yet, some way, somehow, God sees in him something worth developing, worth growing. God sees in Jacob not a weed to be pulled for his nature of mischievousness and wickedness, <coughs> but a flower yet to bloom, good fruit that could bear forth. It's easy, especially if you don't know the rest of the story, to write Jacob off at this point. But God doesn't see him like that. And comes to him and says, look, I'm going to be with you. So don't be afraid. And it's a transformational moment for Jacob. I think. Hold that thought, because that's the last part of the sermon. Because we still have the parable. The parable where Jesus talks about weeds. And I told the kids, I don't want to call anybody a weed in conversation. And there's lots of reasons for that. But one of which is Jesus says it's not our job to figure it out. There's lots going on in this parable, but that's one of them. Who is the one who discerns the wheat and the weeds? It's not the gardeners. It's not the field workers. They go to the farmer and say, hey, you want us to pull the weeds up? He says, no, 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 no. Now, within the parable, a part of it might have been that in Palestine there are two plants that look very, very similar. One is a form of wheat and one is a weed. The only way to tell them apart, I don't know but it can't be done until they're harvested. I think I forgot. Someone told me once. But I know it's done at the harvest. It can't be done in the field. So even ignoring the whole piece about pulling up the dirt, which is also true, you can't tell which plant it is until you've pulled it up. And so if you try to pull up the weed, you might pull up the wheat instead, and that's what's wasted seed. That's wasted money. Don't try and figure out who is wheat and who is weeds, Jesus says. It's not your job. What is your job? Well, not said in the parable directly, but, you know, they're farm workers, right? A lot of you are farmers. What do farmers do? Nurture the soil. Provide water and food and nutrients. Plant. You all harvest, that's the angel. Care for the crop as it's growing, to give it the chance to bear good fruit. What does that mean? It means do the work of loving, caring, 
and compassion. Look at those around you, those around us, and know that they have the ability to bear good fruit. There might be a weed, true, but we don't know. It's not our job to know. Our job is to do all we can to tend the soil, tend the world, tend to those around us, that they might have the chance to bear good fruit. So love them, care for them, walk with them as fellow children of God, and let God take care of the rest. And I believe that very much includes ourselves. That we're called to do all we can to bear good fruit, to tend to our own soils, our own fields. And here's where I'm doing the two things in the sermon. One is to stretch the metaphor a little further than it really wants to go, and also a little more personal than just go do all these things. I think, while there might be people who are weeds in the world, there are certainly weeds in us. Places where we're not to do what God wants. Maybe we feel a bit too much greed. Maybe we get overly jealous. Maybe we just can't quite figure out how to love an annoying person at the office who, oh my goodness, will they please just shut up. Y'all know what it is, right? I'm not going to go through the list of sins and things that are wrong in the world. We all know the places in your lives, in my life, in our lives together, where there are weeds that need pruning. And the metaphor and the parable doesn't say to prune weeds at all. And again, I'm stretching it a little bit. But I think we can. I don't think we're required to keep ourselves greedy because we are pulling up the kindness in our lives. I think while the people in the world that are our jobs to prune our own selves, we can work on those weeds. We can work on those places where we aren't bearing fruit. On those places where we know we're not living up to God's standards, God's ways. And seek ways to do just that. We can pay attention to our own worst selves and as long as our best selves and then do that. Find ways to be more loving and caring and generous and compassionate to be people who walk in the ways of Christ. I think this because why not this parable, but lots of other ones, Jesus calls us to do just that. And also, Brother Jacob, I told you to hold that thought about the transformational moment. And here's why. Jacob was a terrible human being. And then God comes to him in a grace-still moment. And he becomes less terrible and even eventually a decent guy, eventually. Now, it does not a, you know, sharp incline all the way. He still says some tricks in his father-in-law. He still eventually would run away without giving his father-in-law a chance to say goodbye to his daughters and grandchildren. And he'll do the weird thing with the sheep and the spotted weeds that's not actually genetics, but it's there in the Bible. Read it later. Um, he also will also be the man who, when he sees Rachel, will agree to work for seven and then 14 years just for food and shelter in order to have Rachel in his life. He will also be the man who somehow finds a way to care in ways for multiple wives and 13 children, and not always perfectly, but they hang together as a family. And that says something about his ability to be a decent human being. He's also the man that will eventually, I think this will come up in that reading in a couple of weeks, will wrestle with God find a way to ask forgiveness from Esau, his brother, for the ways he had been terrible in the past. Jacob is transformed in this moment. And it's not immediate. It's not snapping fingers. But it's the beginning of a journey for him to be the person
person God sees him to be, one who can bear fruit, one who will be the founder of the nation and the people of Israel. Friends, we don't know who among us is a weed and a flower and a fruit, who's a vegetable, who's corn. That's not our job. Our job is to give them all a chance to be like Jacob, to grow and develop the flower God sees them to be. Our job is to love and care for others as we tend the soil together and watch the weeds of our own lives as we too seek to be the people that God dreams and imagines we can be. A people who bear good fruit. It's not always easy, it's not even simple. It is our call, our gift, and our blessing. Thanks be to God. Amen.